Life Sunday is observed today all across the nation in different churches. This is the weekend of the annual March for Life in Washington, D.C. Some of our own members were in attendance there on Friday. The reason for this date is because the landmark decision by the Supreme Court legalizing abortion in the United States was made on January the 22nd, 1973. And you know this as Roe versus Wade. The versus part is what easily comes to our mind on this occasion. Pro-life versus pro-choice. Anti-abortion versus pro-abortion. Conservative versus liberal. Republican versus Democrat. Christian versus worldly. Us versus them. But who is us and who is them? I know this young man who had been raised in the church, his parents, solid, LCMS all the way. Now young man leaves home. He is away several months, comes back. He runs into me. And he shared me this story, painful story. No, more than that, it was a confession to me as a friend and a pastor. Him and his girlfriend. She got pregnant. Neither one of them was ready, so she had an abortion. And neither one of them told their parents about it, ever. And they will never know to this day. They would have been grandparents, still don't know. You probably don't know that young man, but that story isn't unique. Chances are you know a young man or a young woman just like that. Or maybe you don't know. Or, as was the case here, you don't know that you don't know. That the people who have been affected by the abortion are not them. They are us. And that they, you, have to live with it. If this is something you are having trouble identifying with, here's another example. Some of you have been there. Some, or should I say many of you, will be there. I was there with you on some occasions. Some of those instances, you were out on your own. Either way, you had to do it on your own. When your loved one was brought into the emergency room or transferred into the intensive care unit following a dramatic event or an episode, or maybe it was just a plain old hospital room, and the doctor came, the doctors come in and they say that, well, there's nothing that they can do. And then they ask you about those life-saving measures, the uh, do not resuscitate orders, the advance health care directives, the wishes of the patient. But it's ultimately you. It's up to you to have that final word. 
and with the advancements in the medical care that we have, lots of people present in this room will have to be in this position where you have to decide that life and death question and you will have to live with it. So on this Life Sunday, don't think of this as us versus them because ultimately there's no them. It's just us. And it's not about us. It's about us and God, but not God versus us. There's a passage in the Scripture that, to me, speaks volumes on the life issues. It's from Luke chapter 1. Let me read it to you. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Of course, this reading seems a little bit out of place in many ways. For one thing, we just got done celebrating Christmas and the this text belongs in the times prior to it. And it's not really used that much, as far as I know, as a, as a pro-life text. But if you think about it, when did the Word become flesh, using the words of St. John in his description of Christmas? When did this incarnation take place when did God become man was it on December the 25th maybe we should celebrate it in March nine months before December because that's when the creator of heaven and earth began his dwelling among us. This is when he became one of us. Not in Luke chapter 2 with the shepherds and the angels. It's even more humble. He became one of us. When he was a, a two-cell human zygote drifting down the fallopian tube of an unwed Jewish virgin. And then every few hours, he doubled his number of cells until a few days later, he made himself a dwelling inside his mother's uterus. And there he would remain for the summer and the fall. God tabernacling in amniotic fluid. God growing a heart, liver, and lungs. The people back then, and even today, we picture this mega God, Messiah, 
This Jesus you sometimes you see in some of the pictures with those bodybuilders' muscles ready to crush his enemies and our enemies and fix the world for us. But instead of that, he chose to come as a baby. The creator who fills this whole world was at some point so small you wouldn't be able to see him with a naked eye. He was himself an unborn baby. So there's really no question where Jesus stands on the issue of when life begins. Not only did God choose to become flesh as an unborn child and therefore joined the ranks of the most dependable and vulnerable in the humanity, he joined the ranks with their mothers as well. His mother's body provided life to his body. She felt him move inside of her. Theirs was an intimate connection only a mother can understand. Yet, remember, she was a teenager. She was pregnant out of wedlock. Her future husband wanting to let her go quietly because of her pregnancy. Once again, God chose to enter this world surrounded by suffering people in desperate situations. The kind of a situation that that young man that I've told you about and that young woman, his girlfriend, when they got pregnant. And countless others. You might know someone like that. When people are scared, confused, desperate, they're vulnerable and easily manipulated by lies that tell them, I, well, it can all go away. It's just a tissue. It's not a human life. There are politicians who celebrate it as a choice, celebrities who endorse it, and abortion providers that enable them to go through with it. But it does not go away. The guilt, the lies, the regret, the shame, they remain. But there's love that is stronger than even death. The love of God which he gives to all, including the unwanted, the desperate, the guilty, and the ashamed. So why didn't Jesus descend from heaven as a fully grown 30-year-old man. After all, that's the image we are most familiar with. This is probably what we see Jesus as because we think about him as a man in his prime when he began his public ministry, when he preached, when he taught, when he performed all the other miracles, when he uh, call, called his disciples. That's what most of our perception is based upon because that's what most of the gospel texts are all about. Except for just a few texts 
like the one I just read to you a few minutes ago out of Luke chapter 1. So why is it? Why did Jesus begin his life as a two-cell zygote in the fallopian tube? Well, the reason is you. The reason is us. This is how we begin our lives. We spend nine months in the womb. So God did that too. And the purpose of God doing it is not to mimic us humans, not to copy us, but to save us, us. It's not about them. It's not about us versus them. It's God and us. Every guilty and ashamed woman who aborted her baby, every young man who never told his parents that he decided not to give life to their grandchild, Jesus, the baby, was born to set them free from guilt and shame. For every employee of an abortion provider, for every doctor who performs it, Jesus, the physician of soul and body, shed his blood on the cross to reconcile them to his Father. For every politician who uses abortion as a means to gain more power. For every politician who fails to deliver on their pro-life promises. Jesus stretched out his arms and died to make peace between them and heaven. For every one of us who has struggled with the end of life pain and the decisions and the results thereof. There's no sin so big that God's love is not still bigger. There's no shame so great that his righteousness won't cover. Whatever your sin your guilt, your shame, your regret. He's not versus you. He's not against you. God is for you. For your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.